Good morning. We'll be in Genesis chapter two. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's gonna go along with the uh, the one we did in Genesis one. And what I talked about in, when I did the one in Genesis 1 is basically when that stuff's recorded there because when Jesus Christ comes to bring the, the times of restitution, he's going to work Genesis uh, 2 and 1 out backwards all the way back to where there's just a heaven and earth and God. And Genesis chapter 2 follows that same pattern. Now look at Genesis 2, 1. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. Now that's an interesting thing for him to say finished. Look at Revelation chapter 7, or chapter 10, sorry. So what's going to happen is uh, when Christ comes back to set up his kingdom, he's going to finish something. And it involves the heavens and the earth. Look at Revelation 10, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be what? As he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Now the question is, what's the mystery of God? Well, you need to run the reference to the uh, the voice of the seventh angel, figure out where he's at, where else in the book of Revelation. And where he's at is in Revelation eleven fifteen. Look at it. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. <clears throat> so in Genesis 2, you have the generations of the heavens and the earth. And then in, Gen in Revelation 10, 11, you have the regeneration of it. And look at, uh, look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Because he says they're the kingdoms of this world. Well, what is the world? You know, people quote John 3, 16, and they think the world there refers to people living on earth. No, it don't. Not in the Bible. The world is much bigger than that. <laughs> Look at 2 Peter 3, 5. He says, For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God, the what? Were of old and what? The earth. Standing out of the water and in the water, whereby what? There it is. The world that then was, being overflowed with water, perish, but the heavens and the earth, which are now. And there's going to come a time. Jesus of the disciples asked what would be the end of the world. He's talking about this present evil world. Yeah. The end of it. Peter tells you what the end of it's going to be. It's going to melt with a fervent heat. But he defines the world for you right there. Heavens and the earth. It's a world system. The worlds were framed by the word of God. So Christ gets the kingdoms of the world, and when he gets them, the mystery of God is finished. That's why in Genesis, go back to Genesis chapter 2. That's why he says in Genesis 2, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. He's talking specifically, he's using that language because this is, this is going to happen again. Now look, what, look in verse 2. 
And on the seventh day, God ended His work, which He had made. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work, which He had made. Now, just like, just like that word finish was used, the word work is used specifically because there's going to be a work that He's going to do when He comes back. In order for these heavens and earth to be finished, He's got to perform a work. He said, what is that word? Look at Isaiah chapter 28. Now keep in mind, Genesis 1 is a recreation after God's uh, fierce anger and wrath was poured out. You say, why is that? Because <laughs> it's going to mirror something that's going to happen again. God's wrath is going to be poured out, and then uh, after His work, He's going to rest, and the heavens and earth are going to be finished, and all the hosts of them. Amen, Look at Isaiah 28, 21. For the Lord shall rise up as a Mount Perizim, He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that He may do His what? His strange work. And bring to pass his act, his strange act. Now, what is that strange work? Look at verse 15. This is the word of the Lord to the people which, which are in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death and with hell. Are we at agreement? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through. It shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. So in verse 15, they made a covenant with death and hell, and they said, When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come to us. Now look at verse 16. Therefore, because of what they said, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone. Who do you think that is? A tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now that's the only way that uh, what's about to happen, the only way you're going to escape verse 17 and 18 is if you believe on him. Amen. Now this is what happened to those people who made that covenant with death and hell and didn't believe on him. You ready? Look at verse 17. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. That's that refuge they made in verse 15. They made lies a refuge. It's going to sweep away the refuge. And the water shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. That's his work. Now that overflowing scourge got them. Look at Isaiah chapter 10. I'll show you what that overflowing scourge is. Isaiah 10, verse 24. Therefore thus saith the Lord of God, or Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. For yet a little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. And the Lord shall stir up a what? For him, according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb, and as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. There's a scourge coming from that king of Assyria and those that are joined to him through a covenant with death and hell who said that that thing is not going to come to us and it does. And it, it comes from that stone back there in verse uh, or 16. Now this is the work Christ is going to do to get the kingdoms of this world to be his kingdoms. 
Now he talks about his rest. Look at Isaiah chapter 11. God ended his work. I just showed you what the work is. Right after the work, he takes a rest. Well, what is that? Well, it's a picture of the millennial reign of Christ. And Isaiah 11.10 talks about it. Look at Isaiah 11.10. Now, you, I mean, you should all be familiar from verse 1 to verse 9, what that's talking about. But in verse 10, he says, In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, we shall stand for an ensign of the people, and to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. This comes after chapter 10, where he talks about he stirs up that scourge. So after he does this strange work, he sets up a rest. Now look at Leviticus chapter 23. When Christ sets up his rest, he sets it up on what day? What feast day? Anybody know? Where's that at in the Bible? Zechariah 14, right? Comes back, sets up his rest on the Feast of Tabernacles. The nations who don't come up and worship him on that feast, they don't get corn or rain. Look at Leviticus 23. This is why when he comes back, it's going to be a rest. Look at 23.34. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be in holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It's a rest. And it's going to last forever. That rest is going to last uh, for, through eternity, really. But he says in Genesis 2, 2, on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Now, I read in the 1611, and this is the way the 1611 writes that thing out in Genesis 2, 2. You can look at it. And follow along with me. But he says in Genesis 2, 2, and there's something to all these spellings, guys. It teaches you doctrine. He says, And on the seventh day God, in, uh, God ended his work, which that double E showed up. Y'all remember that? Which he had made and and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. You say, why is that? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. All things were made by him. Not anything uh, that was made without him was made. They work in unison. The Father and the Son, or Father and the Word were there, and they both get credit for creation. That's why he, they write that thing like that. The double E. <clears throat> look, at, uh, look at Psalm 45. Because when this work comes up again, both the Father and the Son are going to perform this work, but they're going to do it in unison. Christ is going to perform that work that we just read about, Isaiah 28 and Isaiah chapter 10. And he's going to have the Father's approval. Psalm 45. Uh, verse 1. <clears throat> My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made. See in Genesis 2, he's talking about everything he made. It, it points to something that's going to happen. He, point, he says, I speak of the things which I have made, touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty. 
with thy glory and thy majesty, and in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness, and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Now this is talking about when he comes to perform that work, to set up that rest. Now the question is, who's talking here? Y'all see verse 6. That's quoted in Hebrews chapter 1, talking about the Father saying to the Son. The Father gave Jesus Christ the approval to have his right hand teach him terrible things and shoot uh, arrows through, the king, through his enemies, perform his work. So that work they did in Genesis 2, they did it together in unison, and when, they come, when he comes back at the second advent, they're going to do it together in unison. Because he tells them to ride prosperously. And then, at the end of it, he says, o, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Now look at Genesis 2, 3. <clears throat> you're going to need Genesis 2, 3, and you're going to need Psalm 118. <laughs> It says in verse 3, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now why did he bless it and sanctify it? Because it was, it was made, he made it a day of rest from his work. Now look at Psalm 118. It's just a specific day, guys. Psalm 118.22 The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. I just talked about it in Isaiah 28. That stone comes to perform a work. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. After that stone is made uh, the head corner, look at verse 24. He makes a day. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And he blessed that day. Now look at verse 26. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God blessed that day, and on that day, those people living in that day, that blessed and sanctified day, they're going to bless God. And they're going to bless that stone that comes in the name of the Lord. Out of the house of the Lord, too. Out of the house of the Lord. The right. Because he says that. Because he walks in. That rejoice and be glad in it, that is, yep. that is the marriage of the Lamb in Revelation 19. Yep. I'm sorry if you were going No, you... That, I mean, I wasn't actually going there, but... I mean, that proves what day it is. Yeah. Let us be glad and rejoice for the marriage of the Lamb is coming. Now, in Genesis 2, and what I'm trying to tell you guys is this stuff's going to happen again. And if you don't believe me, well, the King James translators believe me. Because this is a note they put in verse 3. Down here at that phrase where it says, He rested from all His work, which God, they said, created and made. That's what the text said. It looks like this. And then they got a cross right there, which indicates they have a note on, that, on this column over here. This is what they said the Hebrew said. Now before you get scared... I'm about to show you some advanced revelation in the English. This is what it said. This is what they said. Created to make. You know what that means? Everything he created in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, he created to make it again. You know what Jesus Christ said in Revelation 21? He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. 
And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. You better take it to the bank. Amen. He's going to make all things again through Jesus Christ like he did in the beginning, John chapter 1. In Revelation 20 and 21. And all thought, the Bible tells the same story over and over again. Look at 2.4, Genesis 2.4. Now in Genesis 2.4, it starts the first set of generations. I, I don't have time to list them all out. There's 14 of them. But the first set of generations includes heaven, heavens and the earth. And the last one is uh, the generation of Jesus Christ, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. That tells you what's created in Genesis 2.1 and all those generations were bringing about the person who's going to inherit that 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 generation. Amen. That's the reason why that is. Amen. Now, yep. Now look at verse five. Oh, we'll read verse four. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Now, he says that the, there hadn't even been rain yet. Matter of fact, rain don't even fall on the earth until Genesis chapter 7. You know how many years went by from, from I don't know, what, Adam's fall to Genesis 7? I mean, it's almost over... Uh, it's pretty close to 2,000 years. Now, what's interesting is almost, it almost seems like every 2,000 years, uh, it seems like the Lord shows up and talks to somebody, which means we probably are getting pretty close for Him talking to us, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but in Genesis 6, God... <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah. In Genesis 6... God looked upon his creation, and he said that, that whole thing was been corrupted. And because of that, he was going to destroy it with a flood, and you know Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, right? So God reveals to Noah that what he was going to do in the earth, and he tells Noah to build an ark. Now from the time God told Noah to build the ark, to the time God brought that flood, I would say, this is just Noah, roughly 100 years passed. Now, if you read what Lamech says in verse, uh, what verse is that? Uh, 29. Yeah, if you read what Lamech says there, it almost seems like uh, they knew about a flood was coming, even before Noah was born. Well, they did because Enoch talked about it. Yeah. But see, the thing you get from Enoch in the book of Jude is talking about the second coming of Christ. Now, the way prophecy works in the Bible is it always meshes in something that's recorded in the Bible that's going to happen immediately, and then something that's talking about the second coming of Christ. And the reason why is because everything that happens, as far as God's wrath or God's blessing, is, is a dress rehearsal for the real thing. Amen. So they mesh it together. So Enoch was talking about this flood. But we'll say, uh, we'll say roughly 100 years the uh, second Peter, Peter uh, calls him a preacher of righteousness. Noah was preaching for a hundred years it was going to rain, and nobody ever even saw it rain a day in their life. Never. They thought he was crazy. But you know what? That's how people react when you preach on the second coming of Christ. But you know what? Did the rain come? Rain came, didn't it? How many people died because of it? Everybody but eight people. Look at Psalm chapter 11. You know what that means? Y'all know the second coming of Christ is likened to a rain and a flood. God said He wouldn't flood the earth with waters. He didn't say not with fire because the fire is coming next. 
look at uh, Psalm 11, 5. Now, this is an interesting verse. People don't want to believe. They don't even want to act like it's in your Bible. And the Apostle Paul said you should be singing this stuff. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Hmm. God don't hate nobody. What a way to talk, Lord. It's right there in the Bible. You should read Psalm 5, 5 too. Uh, verse 6. Upon the wicked shall he rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in horrible tempests, this shall be the portion of their cup. It's coming again. And Christians for 2,000 years have been talking about this rain that's going to happen. Nobody's seen it coming. Matter of fact, uh, I don't even think I read the verse in Isaiah 28, but after he talks about that overflowing scourge, uh, they're going to be trodden down by that overflowing scourge. He says, be ye not mockers. And Peter talks about those scoffers in the last days saying, Where the, where's the promise of his coming? It's coming. Look at 72, Psalm 72. Verse 4. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. Amen. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. Yeah, it's going to be a fire shower. That's what it's going to be. And Jesus Christ was talking about in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about how much man is better than the certain things of creation. He talks about, you know, consider the grass, which today is, and tomorrow's cast into the oven. And he talks about uh, let, the, let the chaff grow with the wheat and take the chaff and burn it. And the Apostle Paul said in 2 Thessalonians, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the point is, uh, you don't when you start talking about the second coming of Christ, you you can't really worry about people thinking you're crazy for what you believe and teach, because Jesus Christ is coming. He's coming to judge and make war. Yeah. Now you better believe that and you better preach it. Amen. And if you preach it, you better preach it believing it. Amen. You understand? I mean, there's too many people preaching this book that don't actually believe it. I believe everything about it. And sometimes you have to get down and pray, you know, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Now look at Genesis 2, 7. That's the problem with Christians, though. They don't think they have unbelief. <laughs> they think they got that thing figured out. Now, this is a good one. If y'all went to that uh, museum in Arizona, you'll know why this is a good one. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, verses 4 to 6 is an overview description of a creation, what happened from day... Day one to five, basically. And then you come to verse seven, and verse seven starts day six. It gives you more detail on what happened on day six. And in this verse, we have further light on how God created Adam. Which, if you remember in Genesis 1 1, I taught you uh, what I had, my speculation on how Satan was created. I believe Adam and Satan were created almost identically the same way. Except one was covered in jewels and one was covered or made up of the dust of those things because of the flood and crushing those jewels and metal parts. Now, Adam's creation, he's created from the dust of the ground and then breathed the, the breath of life entered into him and he became a living soul. And then Genesis 127, if you look at 127, 
it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And then Genesis 2-7 tells you exactly what man is. He's a living soul with three parts. You have a body that comes from the dust. That's, the Apostle Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 15-47. You have the soul, which is the inner man. That's Ephesians 4, or 3, 14 to 16. Now look at Job 33. Because then you have another part. It's the spirit. Job 33, 4. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. You see that? You know what that Spirit is called in Job 32, 8? Or the breath of God? Look at Job 32, 8. This word's only in your Bible twice. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth him understanding. The number for inspiration in the Bible is 27. And when you just read in Genesis 2-7 that Adam was made of the dust of the ground, and God breathed into him breath of life, and man became a living soul in Genesis 2-7. There just so happens to be 27 words in that verse. That's the number for inspiration. Now, how many of y'all know before 1828, how many letters are in your English alphabet? Did you know before 1828 it was 27 of them? There was 26 letters, and then there was a picture, which was an ampersand, which is the, I don't even know if I can draw it, that symbol, but it's the other way, the and. There's 27 of them. You know what that means? It means Adam, when he's created in Genesis 2-7, he is a type of a King James English Bible. You say, how do you know that? Because them numbers match up. That's English. And he's made with 16 bones and them, four, and them four fingers and 11 bones from the thumb and the wrist. He's got 16, 11 in two hands. Which, if you add up 16 plus 11, what are you going to get? 27. In 1611, they translated he in Ruth 315, and then they translated another one and put she in Ruth 315. Adam and Eve are types of the he and she Bible put out in 1611. And what did God tell them to do? Be fruitful and multiply, right? Replenish the earth. So you have 1613, 1614, the 1617, 1633, 34, 1640, 1769, and then you have an 1833, seven children. And this one goes back to the he, after uh, six she Bibles. That's what Adam is. He's a type of a King James English Bible. And if that's number, if that's right, if the number of inspiration is 27, and Adam was created in Genesis 2-7, you can about guarantee Adam will speak in English. And the language of God is English. Now, if Adam was a body, soul, and spirit, and was made in the image of God, then what does that mean? That means God's got to have a body, soul, and spirit, right? Who's, who's God's body? What's the Spirit? The Holy Spirit? And the soul will be God the Father. He's in that image. Now look at Genesis 2 8. <laughs> I 
Hey, that also means, if he's made an image of God, that means God's a, a 1611 also. Oh boy, they get mad, they get mad about that. They say you worship a book, and they didn't read where David praised the words of God over there in Psalms, did they? Look at uh, Genesis 2.8. And if you think that's heresy, I'm about to get even, uh, it's about to get even weirder. <laughs> and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Now keep in mind, man was made before the garden was made. And that's going to come into play later. And the Lord God planted a gar garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground made the Lord God grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, a tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now he plants this garden eastward in Eden, and he puts the man there to keep it. Like I said, this proves that the man was not made in the Garden of Eden. Now, it's going to be important. But he also plants trees for the man to eat from. Now, what day of the week is this? It's the sixth day, guys. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. This is what the atheists and the, the Bible scholars will pull on you to make you believe that this is not God's Word. Look at Genesis 1.11. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were what? This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? <laughs> You said you just read in Genesis 2 9 that he made to grow trees on the sixth day, and then Genesis 1 it says the third day. Now, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> you want to see something even more wild? Look at Genesis 1 20. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly, let the waters. Bring forth abundantly every creature, or sorry, uh, the moving creature that hath life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament. Look at verse 23. And the evening and the morning were what day? Look at Genesis 2, 9. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst, or sorry, not 9, 19. 2, 19. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. This is still the sixth day, guys. You just read the beasts of the field were made on the fifth day. For an every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. Well, you just read in Genesis 1, 20 that the, the birds came out of the water and out of the ground. But in 2.19, they come out of the ground. Now, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> well, the key, the key to it is believing it. Because once you believe it, you start to look at it. Now, on the third day there, third day, he makes plants. All over the earth. Right? Then birds, he makes out of the water. That's the fifth day. Fifth day. Then he makes beasts of the field and cattle. On the sixth. Then, what does he make after that? Man. Man. On the sixth day. Sixth day, guys. Right after he makes man, he plants a garden. Then in the garden, he makes more trees 
and he makes more beasts and more birds out of the ground of the garden. There's no contradiction, just people can't read. Now look at 2.9 again. That's the answer to that. And I've, I've seen people stand up in universities and tell you can't believe your Bible because of that fact right there. Uh, Genesis 2.9. Look at this. He made uh, every tree uh, to grow, every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you know there's two trees in the middle of that garden? That's what the verse said. Now, if you knowing that, Eve didn't know it in chapter 3. She got messed up. What'd she say in chapter 3? Look at chapter 3. 3-3. Three, three. Well, 3-2. Three, we made either the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. Which one? There's two of them there. I mean, knowing that there's two trees in the midst of the garden will be very important when you come to Genesis chapter 3. And you've got to know exactly what God said and believe it. And that's, that proof right there is the record of that. Because the devil will get... I mean, two chapters in and people already become atheists. Because, of that, because uh, in one in chapter 1, he makes the birds out of waters. In chapter 2, he makes them out of the ground. And people just throw the book away. Yep. Now, <laughs> how are you gonna make it through the rest of that? Book? You can't. You already tripped up in the first two chapters. It gets a lot worse. <laughs> yeah. Now, the tree of life, Genesis three twenty two. Uh, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. It's a tree that was able to make man live forever. Now the point God's casting him away from that is because he don't want him to live forever in, in sin and death. Yeah. Now Revelation 2.7 says it's, it's located in the midst of the paradise of God. So it had to transfer. And I don't know how, I mean, I don't really even have theories on that. I know some people think it uh, descended into the earth, which I don't really understand that because it comes from top down in uh, Revelation 20 and 21. When Revelation 22, it's for the healing of the nations in eternity. And the way that they get to that thing is if they keep his commandments. Adam couldn't keep a commandment, therefore he got kicked out to take of the tree of life. The only, the only commandment he had to keep was don't eat the one that was right beside it in the middle of the garden. And he did it anyway. <clears throat> now, in New Jerusalem, you will have God, Jesus Christ, and the nation of Israel living within that city. Now, Israel will keep its right to, to that tree forever because of the New Covenant. Because the New Covenant says that He's going to write His laws in their hearts and they'll be able to keep God's law fully. They're going to have that right to the tree of life. But there's people outside the city that have to keep His commandments to enter the city and eat of that tree of life. And that's the nations. I don't know how that works. But all I know is the law will go forth out of Zion and the nations will be placed under that law. I don't have... I mean, that's... Look at Genesis 2.10. I don't even have time to get into how deep that goes and how much of a you know heretic people are going to label us after that. I mean, this is the Bible, folks. We can't act like we got it all figured out. <clears throat> Look at Genesis 2.10. And like I said, if you thought what I was teaching earlier was heresy, this is about to get wild. <laughs> and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. 
There is bdellium and the onyx stone. Now those are some interesting verses. You want to know why? Look at 13 and 14. He don't say nothing like that. You can come in, brother. Look, he just says in 13 and 14, the name of the second river and what it compasses. And 14, he says the name of the third and the fourth and where it compasses. They don't say nothing about gold or whatever's there. Now, <laughs> Why, why would he specific, why would he why would God even just write that about Havilah? Well, my theory, this is my theory, you know, my speculation. I believe Adam was made in the land of Havilah. And then God planted a garden eastward of Havilah and he put him in it. But here's why I think he was made in Havilah. You know what Adam means? I Googled what Adam means. <laughs> This checks out. Don't worry. Don't worry. I know it means man, but look at this. Son of red earth. You know what word's closely connected to that? Edom. You know what Edom means? Red. You know where the land of Edom was? Is right almost near where Havilah is on a map. If you look at uh, the Persian Gulf, the Tigris and the Euphrates go up like this, and then in 1990 they photographed two dried up riverbeds that went that way in Saudi Arabia. And Edom's around there where that, uh, the river of Pison went. And you know who's down there right now? Esau. Esau's down there right now in Arabia. And what Saudi Arabians look like is a whitish, reddish color. They're white and ruddy. And so Song of Solomon 5, she says, My beloved is white and ruddy, chiefest among 10,000. He's the last Adam. <clears throat> now, the reason why I think God gives you the info about those metal and those stones there, because Adam was formed of the dust of the ground, right? So I believe the atom was formed of dust particles of those three things mentioned there in Havilah, along with red, red clay-like mud. Now here's why I believe that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This has to do with Adam's kingship, guys. And believe it or not, it has to do with yours too. First Corinthians three eleven. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, thereupon, he shall receive what? Now I said gold, silver, and precious stones. The land of Havilah had gold, didn't it? The gold there was good. Gold? Then it says bdellium, right? Y'all ever ran a reference on bdellium? The only other reference is to manna, where it describes manna as the countenance of a coriander seed and had the color of bdellium. And it looked like a, a white hoarfrost on the ground. You ever seen silver shine in the, in the sun? That's got to be that, guys, or something close to that. Then he says the onyx stone, where he says precious stones there in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. What does he say in Genesis 2? He says the onyx stone, right? Sorry, I'm getting messed up. Onyx stone. Now he only mentions one stone there. 
I tried to look up what the color of onyx stone was, and all I could find was like a black stone. Look at Revelation chapter 1. I think Adam was made with these particles here, of that dust, because God was giving him a body made in his image to be able to have complete dominion and reign over the earth as king. Now, I'm going to show you why. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Verse 14. 114. This is talking about Jesus Christ. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Like when silver shines, it looks white. You almost can't even look at it. Now look at verse 15. And his feet likened to fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Now, whatever that's referring to, if that's talking about brass that's burnt, burnt brass looks black. I deal with it every day. I'm a welder. Now, everything on the oxyacetylene torch, everything on the welding gun is brass, and when you're about done working with it, it's black. Now, if that's what that's referring to, then it's black, which would match the black onyx stone. If it's not, I don't know what it, what it would look, what he means by that. But look at verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his, count, his countenance was like what? The old son. Jesus Christ has all three in his glorified body. And that's significant, because if what I said is true, then the gold, silver, and precious stones of 1 Corinthians 3 are rewards of types of bodies that God will give to Christians who are capable of reigning with Jesus Christ. And the wood, hay, and stubble is something you're going to suffer loss of. And you're going to get a body of a servant not reigning. That's what that means. If what I just said is true. Now, what I said that is all... The scriptures seem to indicate that. I won't say it's. I won't be dogmatic about it. But other than, I mean, how else you explain? I mean, does anybody else have a good theory on why God talks about the gold and the bdellium and the onyx stone in Havilah? <laughs> Look at Genesis two thirteen. Well, we already read that. Sorry, but anyway. That just talks about the two rivers. You can look at it on a map. It's right where Kuwait is, around Kuwait, the Persian Gulf. Which means this, I mean, God's not just making up some place like uh, Joe Smith said. He found, you know what I mean? You can locate this stuff on a map, guys. As a matter of fact, Kuwait's one of the most richest countries in the world. And they actually have no fresh water source, which was interesting. Because in two rivers, the Pison and the, uh, oh, what's the other one there? Gihon. Those are the two rivers that dried up, which would explain why the Garden of Eden's not there. Now, apparently, it was such a big garden that needed four rivers to go into it. Well, if you lose two, it's gone. Look at 2.15. Genesis 2.15. Sorry. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of the tree, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now that commandment's important. And it's also important to whom God spoke it to. <clears throat> because... Woman's not even made yet, guys. The woman's not even made yet till uh, what verse is that? 22, 21, 21, 22. 
And it's interesting why the devil comes and attacks the woman and asks, he, asks her, yea, if God said. Well, he knew, yeah, apparently he knew that she wouldn't know and she would just make it up. Now, Ruckman always said, if you find a woman who uh, isn't scared of snakes, you found, a, you found some type of woman. Because <laughs> most women are scared of snakes. Huh? What did he say? That could be. That's what Daniel Cannon believes. Yeah. Which is, uh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Like well, 218. And we'll close out. Everything that happens from 218 to verse 20, 25, the Apostle Paul puts as an application to Christ and the church. I'm going to show you this. Verse 21. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. All right, he causes a deep sleep to fall on Adam. Now, you know what sleep in, in the Bible is also, also a reference to? Look at John chapter 19. Nineteen thirty-one. When Adam is asleep, now you got to get this. God takes out one of his ribs when he's asleep. When Christ hung on the cross, he died there, and after he was dead, what happened? They stabbed him in his side. Look at John nineteen thirty-one. Actually, look at uh, thirty-three. Sorry, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already. They break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Now Christ dies and is stabbed in his side. You know what was happening? He was creating a new man in himself called the church that he gave himself for. There's the blood that he makes sanctify and wash it with water by the word. It's Ephesians chapter 5. And in Ephesians chapter 2, he said he uh, had slain the enmity thereby in his flesh for to create in himself of one, uh, one new man. Well, I'll just read it. For he is our peace, who hath broke, made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make it in himself of twain one new man, so making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So when Eve was created, she was created to be what? And help me, right? Help me for Adam. Through the death of Jesus Christ, and the church comes out of that death, <clears throat> the church is now, as the Apostle Paul liked to call it, we're also in help me. He said in Colossians 1, 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us what? Meet. To be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And then he said in 1 Corinthians 3, we read it. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together. There's your help meet. You're God's husbandry, you're God's building. So after the sleep and awakening of Adam, he sees the woman and calls her what? This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. The Apostle Paul said that about the Christ in the church, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to 32. So Adam and Eve are dwelling in the paradise of God, with God, in Genesis 2, and it's a picture of what will happen in the future. Everything, I mean, everything in the Bible is something some sort of dress rehearsal for something that happened in the past and it's going to happen again. 
I mean, God dwelling with His people in the garden, and God will dwell with His people in New Jerusalem. That's Revelation 21, verse 30. And God dwelt with His Son, Adam, in the garden. Uh, if you, I mean, Luke chapter 1, He's called the Son of God in that lineage. And God will dwell with His Son, Jesus Christ, in New Jerusalem, Revelation 22. And God's son Adam is dwelling in the paradise of God in Genesis chapter 2 with his wife Eve. And God's son Jesus Christ will dwell with his wife in the paradise of God, which is New Jerusalem. That's the end of the book, guys. Once you get back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, it's the beginning, but it's also the end. But see, people don't, people don't read the Bible from cover to cover. They never make it to see that... Revelation is a restitution of Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3. All right. Now we can have a we can have a vote after church whether or not I can teach again, I guess, since after that. Huh? A vote to a vote. I never met a bread man who hated bread. I don't I don't understand that. Every major university in the world says we come out of primordial soup and turn into a monkey. So uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think we really need to worry about how crazy we sound. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right.